Okay, so as I mentioned before the recording, uh, we're going to break down the lecture or this chapter into two parts. Part one is just going to be more of the theory. <clears throat> part two will be more of the code along. Um, and so this is this is really part one, it's just focused on the theory. Um, that is uh, the theory. The topic is working with model binding. And so, like a lot uh, that's happened in this book is we kind of been we've been working with model binding um, and we just we take with what we've kind of assumed to be true and we add to it so it's like we've we've done this already a little bit before so let's just kind of it's a review of what we've done so far and and adding to our comprehension just more broadly um, <clears throat> so with model binding, um, we're going to have primitive types. When you talk about primitive types, you're talking about your ints, your doubles, you know, your primitive data types, and your complex types. Things like you know, your classes, your students, uh, your NFL teams, so on and so forth. So we're going to work with model binding using both basically the basic data types, aka the primitive, and more complex, aka your reference types or your class types. <clears throat> um, this first bullet reminds me of, and, and we'll get into it, but um, in JavaScript, there was a request object. And so in the controller in the kind of that middle tier that controller um, there is a request object that we haven't really worked with and so we're going to kind of see that but basically um, we're going to work with these controller properties be it a request property to retrieve primitive types from a get and post um, the second bullet I think is pretty uh, interesting and we'll talk about this list the order of places where MVC looks for data when it's binding a parameter and so you have these action methods call it the index action right and it's got a a parameter right and it's gonna bind that parameter from somewhere like for example that parameter might come from the route right that is one place where that parameter can get its value Right, but there's actually, well, there's three places and it kind of has a sequence in which it looks. It's gonna look in place one, place two, place three in that order. And so we're gonna discuss that. I found that really interesting. Um, again, describe how to use model binding to retrieve primitive types from get and post request describe how to use model binding to retrieve complex types and nested complex types and so a nested complex type is when you have a relationship like a incident has a technician right when you have a complex type is one type with another type that's inside of it nested inside um and then how to use name and value attributes of a submit button to post data. So that's a little different. How to post an array to an action method. Uh, describe the use of attributes to control the source of bound values. Describe the use of attributes to control which properties are set. Okay. In your controller, like I would start this discussion off, I would say, hey, like, look at page 368. And if you literally look <clears throat> at the first sentence in this chapter, it kind of describes what we're doing here. And it says, in a web app, you often need to retrieve values that have been sent by the browser to the server in either a get or a post. Okay, so you have a client that's on a browser and that client is making a get request or a post request and the server, the controller, needs to be able to read values that have been sent from the client. So data is being sent from the client to the server, right? So much of what we're doing is just passing data around. For example, view bag. 
you know you're going from the controller to the view, right? So you're sending data from one place to another. View data, remember we use view data to send from one controller to another controller, right? So, so much of this is just, you know, sending data around and these different ways of sending data around. What is model binding? Model binding is from the client to the server, you're reading values sent from the client to the server. I think that's an important first note to make in this chapter is like basically what are we working with here? We're working from, we're working on reading values sent from the client into that controller because that's the server, right? Um, and so one way that you can do this, in other words, do this, you can read values on the server sent from the client are with these properties, be it a request property. Now in JavaScript, we had a request object, right? You guys remember that. We actually haven't had to deal with the request property or object here, but it does in fact exist. And so here's an example of using the, again, this is in a controller, obviously, of using a request object um, to read from a query string, right? So in a query string here, we've got, remember a query string starts with a question mark. We've got a key, if you will, of page and a value of two. So up in our query string, this comes from the client, right? This URL is sent to the server and one way of reading this query string is with this request object. So there is a request.query. There's also a request.form. Now this is on a, on a post. Okay, so notice the, the, the slide title. So imagine this, there's a form with some data filled out. You know, the user fills out a first name Field. Now, it's important, you know, and and if I put this on screen, let me just put this on screen. So in a uh, in an HTML document, you have an input type of text, right? And typically, you have an ID of like text, uh, first name, something like that. And you, this is a pretty standard HTML. Um, keep in mind, there's a name attribute, okay? And so what goes in this name attribute is what you put right here instead of the, inside of the request.form. So this form data this is coming from the client. We're going to read it on the server using request.form. Again, this name attribute has to match first name. And something you're going to see kind of at least more than once, you know, it's actually not case sensitive. You could do something like this and that's going to work out okay. It's case insensitive, okay? But basically, request.form is looking at those name attributes. My assumption would have been incorrect in that it would have been the ID attribute. Okay, but it is, uh, again, the correct assumption is looking at the name attribute. Now, you might be saying, well, Mr. G, you know, we've kind of, you know, we've been working with form data and, you know, we haven't had to use this request property as it's called, right? This is a request property. And I would say, well, you're right. We've kind of, we've been using model binding to this point. And because we've been using model binding, you know, uh, we haven't had to do this. And so I think this first page on, you know, introducting to model binding um, and these properties of the controller class 
you know, by and large part, they're showing you another way of extracting information. But by and large, we're, we haven't used it and really we won't really need to use it a whole lot. Okay. Um, these are now, now we, we kind of looked at two ways of looking at this request property. Um, route data kind of comes next. Again, we haven't, like if we wanted to read our route data, we would use like model binding and we would put the ID in these parentheses, right? And, and you guys have done that. Again, so just another way of doing it is really what this boils down to. Um, so what, what do we have here? Here's our URL. That URL is coming from the client. It comes into the controller. And, well, what is the ID? Well, the ID is the third segment of this route. Home is the controller. Index is the method. All is the ID. And so this parenthesis is the route segment, as you can kind of expect, route data dot values. You know, looking at the route segment, again, is all. So inside of the view bag dot ID, so ID is all, is what that boils down to. And again, just another way of coding the same thing. I think we've all been doing this long enough to say, hey, there's more than one way to code something. And this is just gaining that exposure on how that is. Um, kind of going back here, these properties query and form. Again, just kind of looking at the highlights that I made. These are both actually dictionaries. Um, right, which stores things in key value pairs and you can use um, the, the array notation to refer to the key, right? So request.form and then you pass in a key to retrieve its value. Um, so these are these are both dictionaries and um, that's the main part that I wanted to cover on that this is a little bit more normal for what you guys have seen. Um, so kind of flipping the page onto page 370, um, we see that we're gonna get our ID in our index method. And at this point, I believe you guys are comfortable understanding that that ID, in most cases, we get that from, from the route. Okay, in many cases, we get that from the route. On page 371, um, I want to point out that the order that MVC looks for data to bind to a parameter. So for, I think it's worth, you know, what is binding? Binding is just kind of matching two things together, right? You're kind of linking two things together, marrying two things together. And so, you know, where, what are we binding this ID to? In other words, where are we getting the value from? Um, so MVC is going to give this ID a value from somewhere, and where <clears throat> does it look? And it looks at three places. Place number one, the body of a post request. Um, and so here, you can see a form parameter in the body of a post request. So before it gets it from the route, if you're doing a post, a post request, there might be a form parameter with an ID of two. Now, Kind of going back to what that looks like in code. Yeah, Vinny. Uh, yeah, what does that look like in code? Um, okay. 
So kind of backing up into That's a very valid question. A form parameter in the body of a post request. And then of course we have a route parameter. That's the second way. And then the third way that you can get this is in a query string. So of course, kind of like backing this up, of course we're gonna have a form, um, a form tag with an ASP action of index. Okay, cool, so I, I paused that, and, and what I did was I, I spun up. So the question is, the question is this. <clears throat> um, where can you get this information? And uh, the form parameter coming from the body of a post request, so obviously it comes from the form. And so just taking what we just discussed, and it's like it's looking at the name, um, attribute in HTML that's what I did is I went ahead and I put in a post with an ID and then on on my home page I put in a form and I had a hidden field didn't doesn't have to be hidden but I put in a name of ID and and I hard-coded a value of 10 of course I can pass in 101 Okay, but it's this, it's this name attribute of some control on my form. And so that's going to come from, from the client um, to the server. And if I go ahead and spin this up, I have a breakpoint in there. And when I hit my breakpoint, you could see the ID of 101 was passed in from the value. So... So that is an example of doing, um, of retrieving this. Now, that's, that's binding, right? Basically, binding says, hey, I'm, I'm tying these two things together, right? Um, this parameter is going to be bound to the form, uh, the a control on my form. So that's the first place that it looks by default. The second place that it looks is in a uh, is in a route parameter. So maybe I can pause and demonstrate that one. Okay, unpause. Um, the next thing, a route parameter. And so, you know, as we've done many times before, um, up in the route, right? This is a segment on the route that's part of the default route that we've studied. Um, <clears throat> you know, I went ahead and I made another method called about just because, um, you know, we, we demonstrated this one in another way. I was just going to go ahead and make another action method. And so I made an about method. And then on my home page, I made an anchor tag that took me to the about method. And I put in to the, uh, into the route uh, to match the ID segment. Uh, you know, the number 300, of course, you could just, you know, customer 3003, okay, but the point is, it's going to put that up in the URL, and then that URL will be sent down to the parameter, so as we demonstrate this, I hit my breakpoint, when I click the link, customer 3003, notice in the lower left, you can see the, the URL, it says localhost home about 3003, Boom, I hit my breakpoint, and if I hover, if I hover the ID, you get 3003. Okay, so that's demonstration number two. And demonstration number three is the query string parameter of the URL. Um, so let's stop, and I'll kind of pause this and just code up a demo on that. Okay, uh, so unpause. Um, then the third way, right? So this was the demonstration of the first way, be it from the form, right? If you had a name attribute on the form, this is the second way, the way that we're most familiar with and that we've been using is binding it to the route. 
which has uh, the same name as my default route right here. So ID is that third segment. And then the third way is getting the ID could be bound with a query string. And so you'll notice I have a contact uh, method. And what I did was I, I coded just a traditional anchor tag uh, with the path of home controller contact method passing it a query string ID of 4000. And you know, you can change this to 40,001 contact 40,001. Now notice when I hit my breakpoint, and here's my link. You can notice again, lower left, the URL looks good. I'm hitting my breakpoint, and there, there is my ID coming in from the, coming in from the query string. Um, so that's good. I'm really glad that we kind of slowed that down there to demonstrate the three different ways that you can bind to a parameter. Um, <clears throat> the benefits of model binding. Um, and so in the previous slides, we introduced those two properties, um, the request and um, route data. Um, but this is using model binding, basically automatically linking two things together. Um, and they go through the benefits of model binding, so please allow me to read from the book. You don't have to write repetitive code to retrieve values. You don't have to work with string literals, which are prone to errors. MVC automatically casts the values to match the data type. Model binding is not case sensitive, and you can change how you pass data in an action without having to change code. And so, you know, if you're just looking at the slides that we've covered, we've kind of covered two approaches to reading data sent from the client onto the server. And of course, they recommend the model binding, this approach, um, uh, for the, the reasons listed. Okay, we covered these three different ways and the order that it looks, it's worth noting kind of, you can change that. If you don't want it to look in all three places, you only want it to look in one place. Okay, uh, are you, you know, um, you, can, you can override this behavior. So this is kind of the default behavior. Again, taking what we know, we've kind of done number two for a while now, and adding to it, right? Where else can we retrieve these values from? Number one and number three, we have not done that. At least I don't remember doing that up until this point. Okay, there's the benefits of model binding. Um, this is another example. Again, we kind of walk through this, how you take the name attribute from the form and bind it to parameters in your action method. So this, these are primitive types. What's interesting is that you can't really say object types because a date time is an object type. So um, more broadly types that are built into C sharp. <clears throat> so primitive types here they're referring to kind of the built-in types. A string is built in, a date time is built in, and in fact if you go back if we kind of remember our C sharp class um, you know it, in other languages, there's a big difference between like a string and an int. Uh, for example, in Java, and you know, this is this is just good programmer you know knowledge. An int in Java can only hold a whole number. So you like int x equals you know six. Um, there, there is no like remember uh, x dot two string. You know, if you want to get x value into a label, you could do x dot two string, and in C sharp. And the reason for that 
is that the primitive int is an alias for a class called integer, for an integer class. And so in Java, that wasn't the case. There were no methods on your ints in Java. They just held numbers. So even the simple data types like int in C sharp are in fact reference types, are instances of classes. Okay, so in my mind, I, there's always a big difference between primitive types, which are like ints, doubles, floats, chars, in the Java world. Because Java world, those, those primitive types don't have methods associated with them. And reference types was another name for your classes and objects. All of your classes, you know, you create a class, you create an instance from that class, Therefore, you had methods that were associated with it. That's not really the case in C-sharp. Int uh, is a class in C-sharp. Um, therefore, the distinction in my mind is actually needs to be updated. And this definition of primitive types should just be updated to, okay, what are the built-in types to C-sharp? Ints, floats, strings, date times bool if it basically built into the language that's the category of primitive types that they're referring to versus the classes that you and i create for our software um, that are more what they call complex types okay because again date time well that's that's a class date time's a class but so is an int and they're both considered primitive okay now that we kind of covered those bases um what is happening here? Well, we've got this name of description, so whatever they typed into this text box would be sent into that string. And here, the due date, again, these link, or they bind together from the form data into the parameters. Um, and then with that information, you can see they actually construct a new object. This is a type of to-do. So in comes a primitive data, and then with that primitive data, they construct an object, and then whatever they need to do with that object, maybe insert into a database, what have you. Um, but I think, I think paying attention and understanding, you know, that this is using that that first approach of the body of the post request. I got a quick question. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, in, in the first approach, uh, you're using that name attribute and you're calling ID. Is there ever a scenario where you're going to have like more than one name attribute? Like, you know, and maybe with IDs? Yes. Yeah. And so um, and you might have multiple them? form objects, kind of like what we did. I think we had a lab where on one page you had like three form objects. Right. And so, you know, my question is, like, how does it know which one? So I would say it's just looking for the first. Well, they're going to post to different methods, probably. Mm -hmm. Right? Each mm -hmm. form object is going to post to a different ASP action. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Good question. And I'm pretty sure that's kind of some theory coming up uh, around the corner. So you're just kind of jumping ahead a little bit, which is good means you're paying attention you're, you're woke <laughs> uh, buh, 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 buh. Now, I know you guys are ready for a break, so the last thing I'll say, um, <clears throat> you're gonna notice what they did here was they, they created an object in this way, this complex type, right? They created this object in this way. 
this, um, what you, when you build an object, you can build an object with its constructor. Which remember, a constructor has the name of to do. Right, a constructor is the method with the same name as the class. Looking at this class, you don't see that constructor. Why? Because you get the default constructor for free, right? Implicitly, there's a public to do. It looks just like that. You get the default constructor for free. There's a note in here. It says for comp for a complex type to work with model binding, it must have a default constructor and the properties to be bound uh, must be public. So notice these properties are public and this class does have a default constructor even if you don't code it because you get one for free. Remember that if you overload the constructor with parameters, you must also go back and write the default. You no longer get it for free if you overload the constructor. All right, so that's just kind of going back. Um, that's just going back to here. Now here's an example of taking a complex type and how instead of just passing in the individual values like you were doing before, now you can pass in the complex type. The way to do that is first off, your view has to be strongly bound or uh, strongly typed, strongly typed, right? So we, we learned how to strongly type a view and then you can use the ASP4, again, this description and due date, what did it say? These had to be public description and due date had to be public right so in order for this to work and basically you're allowed to bind a complex type rule number one has to have a default constructor rule number two the properties have to be public and writable what does writable mean well there has to be a set block And that's how you bind complex types, data coming from the form, into an add method, and yeah, I, I don't recall taking anything into a method other than like a primitive type, like an ID. I don't remember taking an object and passing that into a method. Uh, maybe. You guys remember that at all? Yes, no. I'm not remembering it. So this would be this would be new. Maybe. I can't think of a single time. Maybe I'm just forgetting, but that's okay. Um, all right. Why don't you guys go ahead and take a break? Okay. Well, we'll kind of finish up with these last slides here, and then uh, you guys will do some coding uh, out of out of the chapter. So kind of left off showing how to bind what was considered a complex type and kind of the rules around what's necessary to do that. Um, but then you have nested complex types, right? And you call that nested. There's a, the programming term that, that I learned was called aggregation. When you have a class, in this case, teams view model, that has a relationship uh, there is a has a relationship so aggregation is a in quotes has a relationship um what versus inheritance which we just covered in the class this morning is an is a relationship so you're just looking at the english language when one thing is another thing on the board you could say a dog is an animal a pit bull is a dog that's based on what things are and that's how you can begin to understand well this is describing inheritance the english language is describing inheritance when you're looking at a written definition of the problem um whereas if you're looking at a written you know uh definition of the problem you would say that a 
a uh, view model, a team's view model, has a team, uh, that, that's more of an aggregation. Um, when there's a complex type inside of another complex type. Uh, so this is, uh, anyways, um, so how do you do that? Well, of course, the team's view model then is going to be bound um, to the data coming from our form. Okay, so, so kind of the first thing is you could see that this is a complex nested type and aggregation relationship. We're going to accept the parent uh, or the, I don't even want to use the term parent because it's not inheritance, but the team's view model. And then down here is, is the approach that I would recommend. Of course, a strongly typed view for a team's view model. And then you can use these ASP4 um, team dot team ID and then when you post that of course it's gonna generate a team's view model with the fields populated for the team ID and for the team name and so again data being sent from the client to the server um, via via binding and so that's really not too hard to do that. Of course, there's an untyped view that they kind of show you here. This, this uh, lowercase team.name versus the strongly typed view where you we can use the uh, ASP4 helper attributes. Yeah. So I'm just kind of confused because, I mean, it just seems like the same stuff that we've already been doing, like those are just two different. What, what makes it go from, yeah, so to kind of take a step back, I agree with you. A lot of this we have done. Um, it's just kind of a, yeah, behind the scenes, why these things are happening. So, yeah, I, I know that you've done, I'm pretty sure you've done exactly this kind of thing before. But this is a little bit more like, like you said, why it's happening or, um, you know. Yeah. Um, and some, I guess you would also say some other ways of doing it as well. Um, and this is just, just more of the same. Right, so you've got a post, you've got a view that has a strongly typed model, and then when you click that submit button, it's going to send that team object into the controller. Um, all right, so. Kind of going back just a step because here we were using ASP4. I don't think we were using name attributes before, mm -hmm. right? So I think this is new, Ryan. Um, and so here, in fact, when I coded this, this is exactly what I did. It says how to use a hidden field to post a value to an action method. That's actually exactly what I did when I did a post here and then on my on my home page view I had a hidden field with a name of ID and a value of 101 um, The only difference is here, this would be, you know, this ASP4 would go to a team as opposed to an int. Um, presumably, this is a strongly typed view. So model team, and then after your model team up on the view, then you've got ASP4 team ID. Again, 
strongly typed versus non strongly typed. There's there's two different approaches there. And then on the submit button, you can notice model dot name. So if your controller sent on the get request, your controller sent a team to the view, you could use that to populate your button. That's why that button says Seattle Seahawks. Because on the, the get request, it sent in a team for you to use. Um, not too sure, right? So like, okay, again, you're sending a value from the, from the client to the server using a hidden form field. This next, these next two buttons, I don't know how often you're gonna find yourself doing this particular. It says how to use an input button to post a value. So if you actually look at this, we've got an input type of submit and we're sending the team ID across as part of the button. I found that to be a little bit strange because again, I think this makes more sense in my mind, having hidden fields instead of putting it as part of a button. Um, that just makes more sense to me, but here's one way again of putting that data into a button. Now this is an input tag with a type of submit. Remember in HTML, there's input type of submit and there's button type of submit. Um, those are two different tags and they, they kind of work a little differently. Notice inputs, if you remember inputs, they're, they're the self-terminating tags, right? They both open and close themselves, right? Whereas a button, notice the button tag has a different closing element, right? They call that, uh, I always just call it self-closing. Um, oh, they have other names for it. But that's the idea. It closes itself. This one has a separate tag. And what goes, what goes in between here uh, is what you see on the button, right? Whereas an input tag, it's actually taking the team ID and rendering that for the value. That's why this button just says SEA. So this input tag, you can use this ASP4 helper tag, but you're not using the value attribute that you typically use. So you're kind of locked into using the ASP4 instead of the value. And so you kind of get end up with this versus your button tag, obviously this is a better output. Um, but again, I just think this whole thing is just kind of a little strange where you're taking a value and you're posting it um, so here you're, you're taking the team ID and you're sending that back to the server. Again, I think I, you know, this would be my preferred method, just putting the data you want to send in a hidden fields, not wrapping it up in some sort of button click, but they go through and they say, Hey, if you want to work with an input element, you can use this ASP four helper tag and it automatically displays the value of the text. That's why, again, this ASP four automatically displays that the button uh, you give a little bit more control over what what is displayed but there's no ASP4 um, so you're kind of here you're using the name to kind of send that across um, again I just find that a little strange but nonetheless um, one thing we haven't done a whole lot of is like sorting and filtering, right? So you're getting all these results and like uh, some of you in your final projects, you actually implementing sorting and filtering in your, in your projects last semester. And we're starting to get there, right? So instead of having just one page full of, you know, a table and 50 results, maybe you start to create pages of results. Um, and so, again, since we're talking about binding, um, where this lecture turns is to, okay, what if I wanted to have an array of strings and then I wanted to apply some filtering based on that array of strings? 
So think about our inputs. We've had simple types like an int, demonstrated how to bring in an int, demonstrated how to bring in a complex type like a team or a team view model, right? Now, how do we bind to an array? And kind of interestingly enough, it's not that hard. Um, you're gonna notice what essentially we have here is two selects. Remember selects are your drop-down lists. And both these selects have the same name. Notice the name matches the identifier of the parameter, right? So make sure, make sure each select element has the same name and that it matches the parameter name, right? That's gonna pass the two values that are selected, be it, um, now the first value is gonna be either all or LT10 or 10 to 50 or GT50. So the first value at subscript zero in the array is gonna be one of these four things, one, two, three, four. The second value uh, is gonna be all red, blue, yellow, green, or purple. So this is like programmatically what you'll have in the array. Um, notice since these options don't have values, you just get what's in between the opening and closing tag. Is that what the hate raised hand was, Vinny? Oh, I was just curious if, um, you know, if you're trying to pass more than one value, you kind of go back to what I was asking earlier, does it have to be an array in that case? Because if, you know, if it wasn't an array, like, and you have two values that you're trying to pass in. You could just pass right? multiple parameters, mm -hmm. right? You could do a, a kind of like they did back here a little bit, right here, mm -hmm. right? So here's your description, here's your gotcha. date time, here's your first field, here's your second field. And again, you can kind of see the first string is LT10. That was in the value attribute. And since the seller dropdown list didn't have a value attribute, it's just going to store the capital letter BLUE that's in between those options. Okay, these attributes we've we've what, what do they say decorate your methods decorate your properties with these attributes and so you know we've modified our routes using these we've done some validation with these um, we've done different things and so by default we kind of learned the three ways in order that your parameters can receive their values from the form, from the route, and from the query string. One, two, three. Um, so here they are, from the form, from the route, from the query. These, are, these three are there by default. Now there are some additional ways. From the HTTP header, from the services or from the HTTP body. Remember um, that HTTP is a packet and that packet has um, different parts. And so, um, you know, let's see, let's see, frame, frame, frame. This is not what I'm looking for. Uh, bu, 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 bu. Okay, so like your HTTP header is a part of, you know, when, when the information comes into a, a, a web server, you can break down an HTTP header. Look in the HTTP header, you get uh, information like what browser is the client using, right? So this is Mozilla. What operating system are they on? They're on a Mac. Um, so there's information in the header that you can, in the request header, that you can extract. Uh, there's an HTTP body, um, which has, again, more information in it, like data from the form. Uh, so we can kind of extract that. So these are different places you can modify if you 
uh, want to get, for example, if you want the ID to strictly come from the route, right? Instead of looking at the other places, you're hard coding this attribute to say, hey, I want to bind this parameter to the route and I want this one to come from the query string. Right, so you can decorate these parameters with these uh, attributes just like we've done different things. Now this is from the HTTP header with the name of user agent. Again, the user agent is, again, this is information coming from the client to the server. And so what browser is this user using? What version of what browser is this user using? If you've ever wondered where like browser statistics, you know, what are the, what, what browsers are being used? Well, how do they even begin to gather that information? Pretty simply, every client that requests something from a server is sending in an HTTP header the browser. And so from a server, if you ever want to know what browsers are being used on your server, you can inspect the headers and tell what what browsers and what browser versions and what operating systems your clients are using. Um, this is totally possible here. And we're saying, hey, I wanna get a string called user agent from my HTTP header. And then, you know, save that off into a database or whatever you wanna do, right? In this case, they just put it in view bag. Um, so I find this interesting because these are the defaults. Um, header, really, that's probably the information you're gonna be looking at, like what browsers are they on, maybe, maybe what OS that they're using, maybe. Um, so I think that's a pretty cool use case for that. Again, whether you save this. Now, now these are, you know, in the parameters of an action method. This attribute, you can notice this is actually on a, is actually in one of our models. Here's a model called browser. And they're specifically saying that this property um, would be populated from the HTTP header. So it's another, um, place to decorate that. You can also, so, I mean, here's the deal, right? So if, if one of your routes takes this complex type as a parameter, um, you could say, where do you get this property from? So, and this idea that you have these complex types and all these complex complex types are automatically bound. All their properties are automatically bound. You can also say, hey, maybe you don't want a property to be bound, right? So if you have a model that you have a property that you don't want to bind, you can mark that property as bind never. The book does note like, it's interesting that there's a bind attribute to say to bind specific properties. Again, they're all bound by default. Um, and bind never, these are in different namespaces. So it's just kind of curious why that is. One's in this namespace, one's in that namespace. So here's a class called employee. Again, these would be bound by default. Um, but If you didn't want to bind this property called is manager, they kind of go through three ways of saying, hey, um, here's an action method where we're gonna bind name and job title of an employee object. Well, obviously that's two of the three properties that's not binding the is manager. So that's one place that you can do it. The second place to do it would be on the class itself. So we're just binding these two fields. 
Or, of course, you could just go on the class and say, never bind that. So kind of three ways of, of uh, binding different properties or not binding the one property that it goes through. Okay, that's by and large a lot of the theory for this chapter. Like I said, we're going to break this up into two parts. In the second part, we're just going to be doing the uh, coding of a to-do app. Um, so that's where that's where this leaves off. We we get a to-do uh, app with these different filters and these different tasks and adding a new task and deleting completed tasks. So kind of a cool little app that we'll step through um, in the next little video.